I'm very pleased to present to you some information on infrastructure, what's happening now and what's happening next. As Brenda mentioned, my name is Donna Lacquadera Carr, and I am the Industry Insights Research Director at Dodge Data and Analytics. Hopefully everyone on the call is familiar with Dodge, but if not, we are the premier source of analytics and insight into the construction industry in North America. And even those of you who are familiar are probably a little less familiar with the aspect of it that I'm involved with. It's the accelerate circle on this slide. And what we do is market research. We do surveys of architects, owners, contractors, engineers, pretty much anyone involved in the construction industry. We can do those as custom market research to help people understand their brand, their market, um, do some competitive benchmarking, or we also partner with industry partners on thought leadership research. And that looks at critical trends in the construction industry. And what's exciting about these partnerships is that they allow us to publish this information for free. The Civil Quarterly, which I'm gonna be talking about quite a bit, certainly falls under this category, but our premier publication is the Smart Market Report. And uh, we have many, 50 plus is actually a very old number, available for free because of these partnerships located on construction.com backslash toolkit backslash reports. So if there's one thing you want to take away from this, make sure it's that website because then you can go and download and get all that great information. But for today, we're going to focus on infrastructure and specifically what the Civil Quarterly has revealed about it. So I'm going to explain to you what the Civil Quarterly is, and then we're going to look at some of these topics that uh, Brenda already went over. So the Civil Quarterly, as the name implies, is a quarterly publication, but it's actually based on a quarterly survey of civil contractors and engineers. We first launched it in Q2 2020, and we certainly would not be able to bring it to you without the support of our partners, Infotech and Hexagon. So I do need to mention them because they are critical to its success. So every quarter, we look at business conditions. The goal is to understand the health of the civil construction industry through these quarterly surveys. So, um, and you'll see in, in examples of what we mean by business conditions as I proceed on through the presentation. In addition to that, um, every other quarter, we look at two different topics, workforce and supply chain and how they're impacting the civil industry at this point. Um, Finally, every quarter, we also look at two special topics. And a lot of the data I'm gonna share with you today is from that part of the survey. We only have a little bit of space for each special topic, but we, as you'll see, we can find out some very interesting nuggets about key trends that are really exciting and that are going on in civil construction at that point. So we'll do a lot of focus on those, those special topics as well. But I do want to explain to you what the report contains, because yes, it includes all the data that I just described, but it also includes um, some special features. We always have some sort of article that either highlights some of the research we've done or looks at a different but related topic that is impacting civil construction. We've had interviews with people from the industry. We have case studies in there, and we always feature the top projects in, in infrastructure, in planning, and in start from Dodge from the last quarter. So um, really, there's a lot to it, and uh, we typically publish in the second month of every quarter. So the last one just came out in July, and the next one will be coming out in October. Um, finally, before I, I leave this section, this report, this uh, Civil Quarterly, is just part of Dodge's effort to really provide information on infrastructure at this critical juncture when there's so much going on in that sector. So we've also launched a microsite. As you can see, the microsite does feature the Civil Quarterly quite prominently, but it has a lot of other data and information. So I do encourage you to go to that. And if you don't want to actively go to it, just go to it once and sign up for the newsletter. And then you can, be, you can find out about all the cool information that's going on on that site. So that said, let's launch into what the data shows. And we're gonna start with the business conditions that we look at quarterly. So uh, we do survey contractors and engineers, but for this piece, I'm really gonna focus on the civil contractor data specifically. 
And um, the, one of the first things we ask the civil contractors is about their backlog. One of the questions we ask them about backlog is the changes they've seen in their backlog over the last six months. This particular chart shows those changes from the last three quarters. And you can see that there has been significant growth in uh, those who say that their backlog has increased significantly and also growth in those who say it's somewhat increased. So really we're seeing a lot of the industry reporting that their backlogs are increasing. And that certainly comes through when we look at another way that uh, uh, another way of looking at the backlog, which is that we ask them two questions. We say, how many months of, of work of backlog do you have right now, your current backlog? And then how, what is your ideal? What do you, what would you want to have? I, you know, and the ratio of those two tells us the degree to which um, firms feel like they're approaching their ideal backlog. Um, as you can see with civil construction, since we launched the survey, it's been pretty high with that average of 86.78. That is a really, really high ratio. When we uh, did a similar publication on commercial construction, we found that typically the highest it ever got was 78. So, um, you know, this is a really, they're even coming right out of the pandemic, the civil sector has been very, very strong in terms of having sufficient backlog and really having a pretty high volume of work. That said, please look at the last three quarters on the right. So, uh, you know, Q4 2021 to Q2 2022, you can see an extremely steady growth, much steadier, in fact, than any kind of growth we've seen before then. We really are starting to see infrastructure kick into high gear in 2022. And in fact, when you consider the fact that the ratio right now between actual and ideal backlog is 98, you could say that the industry is almost at capacity, that it is very close to really just fulfilling what the ideal backlog is and additional backlog is actually going to not necessarily be a positive at this point. So um, another question that we asked to gauge the, the, the health of the industry is whether they think the market is going to supply them with sufficient amount of new business within the next 12 months. And we have them rate their confidence on a scale of one to 10. And this is just, this chart just represents those who said they have a high or very high level of confidence. Again, I wanna point you to the direction of the chart. You can see how it's getting steeper as we get closer to 2022. And I think it's even easier to understand if you look at the averages for the percentage who said they're highly confident between 2021, 20, 2020, 2021, and 2022. In 2020, it was 56%, which is actually a pretty positive number. By 2021, 69% report that they're that confident in the, the ability of the market to provide them with new business. And in the first two quarters of 2022, it's averaged out to 76%. So by far the vast majority of the industry assumes that they are going to have ample work. Um, we also asked them about what they expect in terms of revenue, and profit margin in the next 12 months. Now this chart just shows those who expect it to increase. Their options were you know, that it would decrease, stay the same or increase. And again, I think it's really helpful to look at how it changes between the average from 2020, the average of 2021 and the average of 2022. Um, back in 2020, only 37% were expecting the revenue to increase in the next 12 months. After the infrastructure bill gets passed, we see a lot more optimism about that in 2021, with 56% saying they expected revenues to increase. By 2022, that's gone up to 67%. And we see similar growths in profit margin from 29% in 2020 to 52% in 2022. So more than half of the civil contractors say, yes, we think our profit margins are going to increase. And this is particularly interesting because right now, up till now, and through the next slide, we've been looking at the headwinds. We are gonna look at some tailwinds. So noting these profit figures 
is somewhat important because there are some things that are causing a little bit of drag on profit in this sector. And even with that, you see that the industry is booming. But before we get to those tailwinds, let's look at why they say they're increasing. So this is the, the, the data from the latest report, the most recent reasons why they're expecting an increase in either revenue or profit margin. A big part of it is, of course, the expectation of more work. And you can see that's just uh, you know huge right now with the red bar being the most current figure. After that, we have the expectation of increased public funding for infrastructure, also about two thirds, very huge, a very huge factor in why they're so optimistic. Um, it is notable that about half say that they can target more profitable work. I think this has a lot to do with those other two options. That volume of work that's out there allows them to really target more profitable work. And I think that's been a big factor in terms of the increases that we've seen in expectations on profit margin in particular. Um, the 30% who say they have a more efficient workforce is really interesting. And when we get into the technology trends, we can get into a little bit more about productivity and efficiency due to technology. Um, that, that seems to be a big driver towards technology adoption at this point in the industry. Um, now we get into a few of the tailwinds. So um, workforce is definitely one. Now, to be clear, Neither the pandemic nor the new rush of work has created a problem with finding skilled workers. There has been a problem with finding skilled workers in the construction industry for over a decade. But as you can see, certainly the high volume of work has increased the need to hire skilled workers. You see it's gone up from 43% in the last quarter of 2020 to 71% who say they need to hire skilled workers in the, in the last quarter in Q2 2022. And we see that the degree of difficulty has gone up. Um, in 2020, only 58% reported a high degree of difficulty, a high challenge in finding the skilled workers they need. By Q2 2021, that had really boosted up and it stayed pretty consistent, 69, 72, 71. These are relatively consistent numbers since then. So we have about 70% who say, this is a really big challenge for me right now. So it's getting more acute, which is not surprising given the higher volumes of work that we see. Um, but the effects cannot be ignored. Um, if you, again, focus on the red bars here, um, in the latest data, 76% say they're challenged to meet their schedule requirements on some of their projects due to the shortage of skilled workers. 73% are putting in higher bids. Um, if you think about those two things combined together and the fact that about half are turning down opportunities for work due to, due to the shortage of skilled workers, you can see that this might have an impact on the effectiveness overall of the infrastructure bill. Because you know, if work costs more and takes longer to do, this is going to impact the immediate effectiveness of the work that's being done um, under that bill. So there are some definite challenges that the industry is facing that in turn, are going to have a larger impact on, on the infrastructure sector as a whole. In addition to looking at workforce, as I said, we also look at supply chain. And this chart is the first um, question that we ask about supply chain, which is about whether or not the fluctuations in the cost of construction materials have had an impact on your projects in the past six months. And you know, back in 2020, only 43% of contractors agreed that they'd seen an impact on their projects due to the cost fluctuations for materials. Look at the latest data in the red bar. 94%, pretty much everyone, is now experiencing at least some project impacts. And what are they having the biggest problems with? In the last survey that we did on this, it was piping and steel, with a pretty high percentage also reporting issues with finding with price increases on pavement and concrete and aggregates. It's not just materials though. 
that are creating these challenges. They are also having major challenges when it comes to construction equipment. And these supply chain issues are a little bit different in some ways than the workforce issues. The workforce issues, again, is something that the industry as a whole has been struggling with for decades due to a lot of demographic factors, fewer people entering the profession, et cetera. This issue is, is, is relatively new. To have these impacts to this degree, um, and to explain this chart a little bit, again, you're focusing on those red bars for what's the latest data on what's going on. Um, we asked two sets of questions. Um, we want to know about the cost of construction equipment, and we want to know how hard it is to obtain it. So for the cost of construction equipment, we asked two questions. Are, have you experienced uh, fluctuations in the cost over the past six months? And then do you anticipate issues with cost in the next six months? And then we do the same thing for scarcity. What did you experience in the last six months? Is it, a, you know, how big of a problem is it? And then how big of a problem do you expect it to be in the next six months? So what these charts tell you is that first, you know, you can see the steep angle of those bars that all of a sudden we've seen a rapid acceleration in the challenge that they have getting their hands on equipment and in the cost of equipment and that they do not expect this issue to go away anytime soon. Now, because we were starting to see these sharp, sharp peaks in um, the issues with supply chain, we decided to do one of our special sections earlier in 2022, in the first quarter, focusing solely on supply chain. So we asked a lot of questions about, any questions in the past were asked about 2021, because we were fielding this in the first quarter of 2022. So um, we asked first about the delays that they experienced in 2021 in receiving materials and equipment. And you can see that over 70% reported it was causing problems on completing their projects. It, you know, um, with 45% saying that they had many problems in completing projects, and then an additional 26% saying that they had major problems, not just in completing projects, but the costs are up, schedules are significantly impacted, et cetera. So a huge proportion of the industry is feeling a really notable impact. Again, we're not seeing it impact terrible and big impacts on their profit margins yet. Those are still so strong because of how strong the market is as a whole. But nonetheless, these problems are trickling out into the industry. And um, when we asked them, and now we're including the engineers too, the upper bars are the civil contractors, the lower bars are what the civil engineers have experienced. When we asked them about their problems faced due to supply chain issues, Again, those delays in schedule are the biggest ones, but two thirds also say they're having price premiums to procure the materials. And especially among the contractors, they are worried that their profit margins are decreasing, even though their profit margins are pretty strong. And it's worth noting that at least a third said they've actually lost money on projects just due to these supply chain issues. Now our goal in doing a special section on supply chain wasn't to just say, look how bad the problem is. We wanted to really get at what is working for the contractors. We wanted to find out what contractors were doing and how effective it was for them. So what we saw emerge as the top five strategies for dealing with these supply chain issues is that 71% um, reported that they were working with their specific suppliers or distributors with whom they have a relationship. Over half were also adding increased time to the initial schedules in their bids, knowing that they might have these issues. About over 40% said that they had project owners more engaged in material procurement, and about 40% were factoring in costs, fees, et cetera, when they put in their bids. And um, we did see about 38% saying that they were actually adding contract clauses that reduced liability. All right, so that's what they were doing. But you know, a lot of them were pivoting very rapidly. They were seeing problems that they hadn't seen before. So there is a question of, well, what works though out of everything they were doing? So we asked each of them that were actually employing these strategies and the other strategies that didn't make this chart because fewer people were doing them, and we said, okay, what was helpful? You know, how, rate how helpful it was. And they did a scale of one to five from not helpful 
to extremely helpful. And those who said it was either helpful or extremely helpful are shown in the chart here. So this is just those who are using these strategies, the share of those who are actually employing them. And the good news is the most popular strategy is also the most effective strategy. That 70% of those who said that they're working with suppliers and distributors with whom they have a relationship found that to be a helpful strategy in dealing with these supply chain issues. Notably though, two thirds of those who said that they got project owners more engaged in material procurement found that very helpful. And this is important because this is a bit of a gap, right? Only 40% were engaging owners in that activity, but of that 40%, most of them found this to be a really useful strategy. So this is something that perhaps owners can, can pay attention to, ways to really keep things moving on their projects, get, keep them on schedule, keep the costs steady. And also, you know, the things that the industry itself can more actively engage in, knowing that this has been a successful strategy for a lot of contractors can perhaps empower some to go to their owners and say, look, you know, data shows this works. Can you help us out with this? Um, another strategy that interestingly was, was reported as effective by at least half of those who use it and is only used by 28% in the industry right now is focusing on local procurement. So that's another thing that contractors perhaps aren't doing very much, but that they, that, that, that may, they may find gives them a big boost. So um, we also wanted to know about things that were out of their control. What did they think could really help with these supply chain issues, even if it wasn't things that they themselves could do? And there was consensus around one item. Improving functionality at the ports was selected by 73%, far more than if the ones selected anyone, anything else. Now, what we see below that is a whole group of things that were selected by between 41 and 48%. And that's interesting because it suggests that there are a lot of different ways. 41 to 48% is a pretty healthy percentage. So uh, there's a lot of other things that, that, that contractors think will be useful, but it, it's, it, it, you're gonna have to attack this on multiple fronts. And it's everything from higher pay for truck drivers to removing the tariffs, on construction materials, to getting COVID infection rates down, to improving highways and bridges and streets. Um, so there are, and, and interestingly, 42% pointed out that increased ability to buy materials directly from the manufacturers is, um, a, is, is a something they think would help. Because right now, the findings suggest that if anything, these supply chain issues have just reinforced the importance of the traditional supply chain distribution within the construction industry, which is really quite unique to it. Um, so, you know, there, there was, I before the pandemic hit, there was a lot of talk about maybe seeing ways to disrupt that to make projects more efficient and more cost effective. But I think the fact that so many are relying on their relationships with their suppliers and distributors is going to reinforce that traditional system. But that said, there is a healthy percentage out there who think that perhaps if they could buy materials directly, it would serve them better. So there seems to be a, a, a kind of a push and pull effect going on here around the supply chain and, and what it needs to be in the future. And I think the future of the supply chain is something to keep an eye on as we emerge from this. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at is technology trends. And again, remember, we saw those increases in the concerns about labor. Um, and you know, when, when you have, when you can't find people, then you've got to find ways to make yourself more productive. And one of the top ways that, that you can do that is through technology. So we're going to look at where contractors are investing right now. And first we're going to take kind of a broad span look from the most recent study that we did on the use of technology on site specifically that contractors are deploying. Now, this is the third Year, the third year in a row that we've looked at this particular issue. So we do have three years of data on it, but this chart shows the data from the current year. And it clearly shows 
that uh, utility detection, ruggedized tablets, and machine control are some of the biggest um, technologies currently in use. Um, you can see this, uh, there's, there's several in the emerging category, but interestingly, um, when you dig a little deeper in the data, and I do encourage you all to download the latest report because uh, we, will go, we do go into detail on all of these uh, four categories. But for this presentation, I think the most interesting activity is going on in site capture. So we're just going to focus on the data on site capture because it suggests that that is really a hot category right now. Now, some of it's just in terms of growth in use. And that's particularly for utility detection and mobile mapping systems. You can see if you compare the data in the yellow bars 2020 to the data red in the red bars 2022, we've seen a significant uptake just in a very short period in terms of use of both of these. A far higher percentage of contractors are using these technologies than were two years ago. So that is pretty exciting right there. Um, we don't see the same levels of growth um, in terms of just new people using them for robotic total stations or laser scanning or LIDAR, but there is a second way we look at use of these technologies as well, and that's intensity of use. So the percentages you now see on these charts, unlike all the other charts you've been seeing up to now, are not the percentage of contractors, it's the percentage of projects. Uh, the average percentage of projects on which the applicable technology is being used. And um, those two categories where we did not see any particular growth in use, robotic total stations and laser scanning and LIDAR, we do see a really substantial growth in intensity of use. So yes, a lot of new people are not picking up and using these technologies, but those who are using them are really finding them effective and are deploying them on a much larger share of their projects. So that also speaks pretty positively to the potential for growth in for both of those technologies. We also see a pretty big uptick in terms of intensity of use, in addition to the increase in the uh, number of people, the number of contractors using it uh, for utility detection. And um, while we don't see any increases in intensity of use for mobile mapping systems, I do want to point out that you know, be, having it in use on average on half of their projects is already pretty high. So unfortunately, we didn't have enough space to go into the benefits that they're experiencing from each of these technologies. That would be a whole study in and of itself. But we wanted to understand what they were expecting. When they adopt new technology, what do they want to get out of it? And that's what this chart shows. So um, what one of the things they want to get out of these technologies, by far the most important and increasing in the share who consider it important to rank it in their top three is increased productivity. So again, that goes right back to all that increase in work, the difficulty in finding skilled workers. They want to use technology to address this issue very, very clearly from this slide. Um, in addition to that, they also want to have um, to be able to to use the data that these the you know we are seeing a, a shift very slow but notable towards data driven construction and the ability to gather data on projects for analysis actually comes in second you know which is not at all where it ranked back in 2020 there is increasing engagement with what data can do for contractors um, on their projects in addition um, we see over 30 percent also saying they want to be able to use technology to manage their budgets to improve their safety performance and to have a better ability to manage the project schedule what are the barriers that are keeping them from adopting these new technologies. You know, why, if, 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 if these new technologies, you know, if they're hoping to get all of these really important benefits, why aren't they just making huge investments? We do see that the cost of technology is too high, is selected by 40%. But I do want to point out that that has been steadily decreasing. And while it used to rank first, now it ranks third. 
So that is important, that they're no longer as much deterred by the cost of technology um, as, they, as they used to be. It's still a major factor. It's still pretty close to the two items that rank above it, but it isn't the sole dominating concern. Instead, they're also concerned about adoption. They, they're willing to make the investments, but they're not willing to make the investments if no one's going to pick up the technology and use it, and they're not going to get the benefit of it. So um, we consistently see a call from contractors, civil or otherwise, that technologies need to be simpler and need to be easier for quicker adoption and not have these long adoption cycles. In addition, they just need skilled staff. In some ways, the technology is also contributing to their skilled worker shortage because they need those resources to manage it. You know, adopting technology isn't just a one and done deal. All right, so that's from our latest publication. Earlier, um, in the a few publications ago, we also looked at more specifically at reality capture. And you could really put that site capture technology as a subgroup under the larger issue of reality capture. And we do see um, a significant adoption of a lot of technology in order to do reality capture. We see drones on top here, followed by digital cameras with project site webcams, laser scanners, also um, adopted by about 20%. But really the, right now, the biggest way that reality capture is going on is through drones and digital, uh, digital cameras. Now, this, this, da this data on reality capture is interesting because it, we, do cap we do show what the, the contractors say. That's what I was focused on there with the purple bars. The yellow bars are what the engineers say um, they're either using or receiving data from. So they may not be direct users, but they're direct beneficiaries from the data that these um, technologies are gathering. Then, we actually had a sufficient number of owners respond to the survey. This was the one quarter so far, which this is the case, that we were able to also compare the responses with the owners. And this was very exciting because um, with owners, of course, we couldn't ask them what they were using on their projects, but we could ask them what they saw being used on their projects. And you see there's, there's a little bit of a surprise here, right? That the owner data is actually much, much higher in terms of the percentages it's a share of owners who are seeing this on their projects than the um, the data of the of the actual contractors and engineers who are working on projects. So why would that be the case? I mean, my best guess is that it's because there are you know an owner is going to hire a lot of different construction firms, a lot of different engineering firms. This isn't a percentage of projects in which they see this used. This is just the percentage that reported seeing used on any projects, right? So, you know, one contractor might be using drones and uh, project site webcams. Another one might be using the detection and ground penetrating web, uh, radar. Another one might be using mobile mapping systems. So they're seeing a lot of different technologies employed, but they're not, you know, but, but the individual firms might not be deploying each technology as much. But this does perhaps create an expectation from owners that there's a certain amount of digital data that they can expect to be extracted while their projects are under construction. And this may be an important expectation as the industry moves forward. We could see owners' expectation of digital delivery being a bigger factor on projects, on civil projects going forward, given the high number who report seeing that data is being gathered from all these devices. So we asked, okay, what are you using? But we also want to know, what are you using it for? And we didn't see any major differences between the contractors and the engineers. So this is combined stats for both. Uh, the most common applications that uh, we see coming out of two for which the, the data that's being captured for reality capture is being deployed is earthwork calculations, project verification and quality control and progress documentation. And we also see over 40% saying they're measuring stockpile volumes and doing site mapping in preparation. So, you know, a lot of activity around these, um, no one that's dominant, nothing that 90% are using, right? But still, you know, over half, definitely finding ways to deploy this data very effectively. 
Um, I, I did also just want to briefly show you the ones that are less common because, you know, there's enough here, one quarter to a third are utilizing these. So there's enough here to know that these can be very effectively deployed as well, but they're still emerging. And that includes everything from material tracking and equipment tracking, material tracking, which might be coming particularly important um, as a way of managing um, their supply chain issues as well. And, you know, things like budget management, machine control automation, these are all things that I think you might be seeing more of, assuming that the applications are easy enough to use. Now, we wanted to find out, in this case, what benefits are you seeing from these specific reality capture um, uh, technologies and applications? So uh, let's focus on the contractor bar, the bright purple bar first. We see over half are reporting that they are, have an improved ability to track project work progress, uh, improved ability to manage their schedules and improved quality and improved ability to manage their project budgets. And we see that over 40% say they can improve safety, uh, they minimize errors on site and increase their profitability on projects. So we see pretty strong project benefits reported by the contractors. With the engineers, we see uh, the greatest emphasis from them on uh, improved quality by far, but also that ability to track work progress is really pretty important to them as well. And finally, the improved ability to minimize the impact of errors on site, something that would be near and dear to the, con to the engineers' hearts. Finally, with the owners, what the owners also report significant benefits. And one of them is improved quality, which I mean, it's going to be very important to an owner coming out of this. In addition to that, the owners like the transparency, right? They like the ability to track work progress themselves on the projects. And surprisingly, owners are the most significant reporters of improved safety. We asked about business benefits as well. In this case, only of contractors and engineers because so many infrastructure owners are public agencies and not companies that would have business benefits per se. And when it comes to the um, business benefits most reported by the contractors, we see increased profitability actually at the top of the list. Now, obviously this is pretty compelling, right? This is probably the reason why the site capture technologies are the ones where we're seeing growth because we see these, these strong business benefits coming out of them. In addition to that, half, oh, nearly half said that they had better client relationships and improved competitiveness. And I wanna point out that the engineers are really finding greater ability to report, um, to offer new services. We looked at ways to increase usefulness of these as well. And, uh, Better, faster ways to share data with the remote team would improve their ability to get more out of it, as would less training required. Again, going back to we need them to pick things up and use them immediately. Uh, improved ability to incorporate data into scheduling management and software important to is important to contractors, as in the improved ability to incorporate data into cost management software. Um, and you can see owners also find less training very important and many of the same issues important. And they want better analysis software. They want to be able to do more with the data that this, uh, this technology is capturing. Now, I've been doing this, I've been talking a lot, praising a lot of technology and talking about what it's bringing to the site, but you do need to consider what's going on with cybersecurity when you've got these, um, this kind of focus on technology. So um, I do want to point out that um, we see relatively good concerns, relatively strong concerns among contractors about their the likelihood of being a, a, a victim of, you know, awareness that they might be a victim of a cyber attack, about the same as the owners, a little bit less than the engineers. But those differences are really strong when you break it out by size. Large contractors recognize the threat. Mid-sized contractors somewhat recognize the threat. Small contractors do not really recognize the threat. And in an article that we published on this topic, it's really, they point out that it's middle market system firms that rely on older systems that need to be concerned. So um, we, and when we look at the strategies that they're using for cybersecurity, we see that they're really relying on technology. Now that's great 
you know, it's really important that they're backing things up daily. And fortunately, even among the small firms, 61% are backing, are doing daily backups, critical for this issue. However, when it comes to other common security measures, we see that um, the ones that are widely used across the industry are firewalls, malware software, email security. But when it comes to the security issues that you can have, that the openings that are created by mistakes made by individuals, we see a far less attention in mid-sized and small firms to things like cybersecurity policies and cybersecurity training than we do at large firms. And the differences become even more pronounced with a less common security measures. Again, things like protecting, having protected IoT devices, creating a mobile device action plan. Um, these things are less frequently, far less frequently um, deployed by mid-sized and small firms than they are by large firms. And I really want to contrast that with what the owners say they're doing on cybersecurity, because you can see the owners, these are just the items that are different from the contractors. You can see that owners are very invested in policies, in training, in a use of these action plans. They're very invested in the ways in which they can keep their people safer. And I think this is very relevant for those in the civil sector to consider because um, for practitioners to consider, because certainly if you want to have great technological connection with your owner, they are going to want to know that they're not increasing their cybersecurity risk by letting you in. So um, this is this could be a very this could be end up being a very decisive factor over time with owners who are very cautious about cybersecurity. What's going to drive people to invest more? It's really getting more knowledge about what's going on. The problem with cybersecurity is that people don't report it. It's not made clear that there are issues with cybersecurity. So we land up seeing, um, you know, they don't realize how many attacks are going on with companies similar to theirs, and they don't know how attacks are occurring. And those are, in fact, more knowledge about those two things would in fact drive much more investment in cybersecurity in the industry. And perhaps one of the most striking slides is that 44%, nearly half of all the respondents say that they are not investing more because they don't think the level of risk for their company warrants further investment. So there really is a compelling call to the industry to, to get more data out there about what's going on in terms of cyber attacks. And uh, Dave Schluger from Zurich really summed it up well. You're not immune. Assume it will happen someday and prepare for it now in the feature article that we had on cybersecurity and that issue. Um, we're going to take a very quick look at the contractor responses to the Infrastructure Act as well, uh, because they're sort of interesting. First, there's a bit of a first we see that contractors and engineers both expect that the Infrastructure Act will have a positive impact on their business. And when we look at the timeframes in which they expect that positive impact to occur though, we see a little bit of dissonance. Engineers should see an earlier impact, but we see engineers expecting a positive impact out through four years. Um, however, the contractor expectation of impact seems to peak between one to two years. Uh, there's still a high percentage that are expecting it to go out to, through four years, but generally um, where engineers are still seeing a very powerful impact, contractors should still just be seeing increases. Um, we do also see that contractors are a little bit more dubious when it comes to the impact of the Infrastructure Act on the construction industry or American businesses in general. That um, about a third agree that it's going to encourage more investment in the infrastructure, but most are kind of neutral on that. Um, very few, if you look at the upper parts of these bars, the darker blue um, agree part, believe that it will make their American businesses in general more competitive. And um, they do actually, quite a few, especially among the civil contractors, agree that they expect it to cause labor shortages. And when we asked about a mix of positive and negative, more specific positive and negative impacts, we see that, uh, you know, they, again, the negative impacts, they're very strong about, they, they think that their workers are going to be more difficult to find, they're going to be more expensive, that supply chain issues are going to be exacerbated. 
And we see a more muted response, still a positive response, but a more muted response, uh, whether it will increase the profit margins. And I think the data already kind of undermines that, right? We've already seen profit margins increasing over the last few years, and certainly in part due to the Infrastructure Act. And, um, you know, sufficient projects to support their businesses over four years. They, they don't expect the effects to last that long, but there is a strong suggestion, especially among the engineers, that it is likely to. But one of my favorite parts of what we asked them about the Infrastructure Act is I wanted to tap their expertise. People don't go to them enough to find out what's really going on in their sectors. So I wanted to understand what they thought about the levels of investment in the Infrastructure Act. So these are the different categories that the Infrastructure Act is divided into in terms of investment. And we asked them whether they thought the, 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 the money being invested was too much sufficient or insufficient. Um, where they really found insufficient investment is in resiliency and improved roads and bridges. So, you know, they recognize that there's a need for an even bigger investment in this country in resiliency and in um, improved roads and bridges. And about a third, or more than a third, really, were also looking for elimination of lead service lines for water pipes, really thought that that was a big area for investment. So we're going to wrap it up with sustainability and resiliency in the civil sector. And again, drawn from one of the articles that we featured in, in the report that featured this data, uh, we had a professor from the University of Washington who pointed out that highway design and construction is 10 years behind vertical construction in, an up, in the uptake of green values. And some of the data and sustainability sort of supports that opinion. Certainly, we, we do not see widespread use of green standards or rating systems. Only about a quarter of the contractors and a third of the engineers report that they have used one in the last five years. And they're familiar with them. They're just not using them. So um, what types of green practices are they using though? Because there's other ways to be green besides using a rating system. And we wanted to really understand the degree to which they were doing it because they wanted their projects to be greener versus they were just required to use these. So we asked them whether they engaged in these practices and whether they were mandated by the owners. And among the contractors, um, mandates were pretty strong, but use was pretty strong among for green storm water management. And we all see engineers using it slightly more than it's mandated. Um, but we do see contractors doing green waste management and using materials with a high recycled content a bit more than they're reporting that owners actually mandate it. Interestingly, we see fewer contractors using local materials for product procurement then actually report that owners are mandating that. And we saw that that was a good strategy as well for dealing with uh, supply chain shortages. So that might be something they'd want to reconsider. Um, engineers, we see that they're generally doing a lot of things such as a life cycle cost analysis, uh, using an environmental construction environmental management plan and using permeable pavements, a great deal more than they report that they're actually mandated to do so. Um, when it comes to the drivers and challenges, um, we see that engineers are far more enthusiastic about the drivers, especially the idea that it's a competitive advantage for their business. Um, but that you know, and that, that contractors um, really aren't reporting a big impact from any of these drivers. So let's start. Let's find. Let, we're going to end with this resiliency discussion. Um, so at this point. Unlike with sustainability, most of the contractors and the engineers report that they have worked on projects that prioritize resiliency. And the average share of the projects that have that prioritization is 40%. So this is exciting. Now, remember, this is an area that they wanted to see more investment from in the Infrastructure Act. And they are seeing a lot of engagement. There's a lot of experience out there with working on projects that prioritize resilience. Um, and this is something we really need, as this quote reveals. So what are they doing to make projects more resilient? Among the contractors, the light green bars, we see a, uh, the biggest emphasis on strategies to reduce the impact of flooding. And we see about a third say they're hardening infrastructure to avoid vulnerability to attacks and designing their assets to function effectively during or after a disaster. Among engineers, Flooding is even more, avoiding flooding is even more important. Hardening is also really important and strategies to reduce wind damage 
is also really high. Um, but we also ask them, well, what do you think should be done more, right? And that is really interesting. Contractors, over half or more, say that they think designing assets to function effectively during or after a disaster and designing facilities to reduce vulnerability to cyber attacks, these are the areas where they really think projects should prioritize more. 40% also talk about strategies to reduce flooding and over a third look at hardening infrastructure to avoid vulnerability to attacks and having the assets recover quickly after a disaster. We see engineers not only doing a lot of strategies to reduce the impact of flooding, but thinking even more needs to be done in this area. 66% of the engineers regard that as a, as a key priority. And we see um, they also really prioritize reducing vulnerability to attacks and making assets that can recover quickly after a disaster a key priority. What will drive them to, what will drive the increase of resilience of US infrastructure? Funding. I mean, there, there's a lot of other factors, but they all rate about a third, you know, only selected in the top three by about a third. Funding is clearly what they're calling for. And um, I really want to end this section with an interesting fact. Now, first, we're just going to look at whether or not they have in-house expertise on making projects more resilient. And we see that engineers, over half of them, report that um, they, I'm sorry, 45% of them report that they have some some in-house expertise to deal with making projects more resilient. We see that's far less common with the contractors, only 28% report that. And a lot of them have no expertise in this area at all, despite the fact that so many of the projects are calling for them. Um, I was curious to see among the contractors whether or not they believed it provides a competitive advantage to have that expertise. So we asked two different questions. For those who already had that expertise, we said, do, are, do you experience a significant competitive advantage? And 81% said yes. Among those who don't have that in-house expertise, we said, do you think if you had it, you'd have a competitive advantage? And only 33% said yes. So I think that there is an untapped opportunity out there for contractors if they can increase their, their expertise in this area to really um, still gain a pretty significant competitive advantage. <laughs>